Hello, strangers. You're tuned in to Neon Static for this week's true scary story you can't find anywhere else. I'm your host, Vi, who's been awake for over 30 hours for no reason other than I'm the only grown up here, and bedtime is when I say it is. While LARPing as an adult is the game we all play, and we can all look the part, sometimes appearances are deceiving, and we're all this close to saying, hell with this. Eating cereal for all three meals and deciding bedtime is never. And that's a theme in today's story. What you see isn't always what's really there. It's story 24. And here's what happened. If Kevin Collier hadn't been known for eating dirt in fourth grade, my best friend would still be alive. He started a butterfly effect that changed everything, all just from being the class's weird kid. While the effect may have started sooner than that, he'd always been a little weird, I guess. I never saw him bullied for it, but I saw kids avoid him. The way kids just zero in on abnormality and set themselves apart automatically. And I heard all about how that kid eats dirt over by the swing sets from plenty of kids. While eating dirt didn't hurt anyone, except maybe Kevin, that's the thing about a person who acts in an unexpected way. Kind of your fault if you bring him to, say, a sleepover, and find out what other lines he thoughtlessly crosses. The problem was, Kevin was strange enough for it to be obvious, and so, he was left out. But I was curious about him. And one recess, I approached him at his customary spot by the swing set, and got his attention. He looked up but his hand continued its path to his mouth. It bothered me to see someone who, in class, often got the top grades. And yet, here he was, being so oblivious as to literally eat dirt. Stumbling to find a way to be kind, I told him his post-lunch snack was why he drew in the attention he did. His response was confused. Why? I tried to explain to him that dirt eating, while not against any rules and not hurting anyone, it was a baby thing to do, like eating crayons, and how ten-year-olds weren't supposed to do baby things. He was staring at my face, and then he stopped me. Why do they think it's dirt? He put a hand in his pocket and pulled out a palm full of white crystals, telling me, it's rock salt. I like the taste. His tone wasn't defensive. It was not an accused person pleading innocence, nor an emotional reaction. It was just one of astonishment. Now I felt my cheeks flush. I stammered out some terrible kid apology, all about how it wasn't me spreading it, which was a lie, or laughing about it, another lie. I hadn't thought it was dirt, Liar, I did. But see, the other kids were saying it. And so on. He was still looking at me, waiting until I finished my miserable stumbling to speak. And then he said, cheerily, I like the salt. Mom said she won't get me a salt lick at the supply store, so this is next best. In the way of little kids' memories, I don't remember if I continued my awful non-apology or if I was spared further by the whistle of recess being over. All I do recall is how Kevin ended our little conversation. He clapped a hand chummily onto my shoulder and said, Don't worry, I make lots of girls blush. It's okay. And off he sauntered to watch the older kids playing pickle by the merry-go-round. That was Kevin. And from then on, I considered Kevin a friend. If the salt lick comment didn't clue you in, ours was a small farming community, full of kids excused at random yet sensical intervals throughout the school year to help their families tend to calf birthing 
or soybean harvesting. Thus, Kevin and I went all 13 years, K-12, through in the same tight-knit class of about 40 or so. Kevin was always there, always a little offbeat, but after that instance in fourth grade, we were friends. Upon graduation, a lot of us ended up at the local state university, where our bumpkin social circle expanded. Kevin went into the Greek system and seemed to thrive, his affable nature keeping his name out of any fights, rumors of hazing, or reports of crimes. I made a few new friends in classes and in my dorm myself, of which Monique was my closest. Her bold eye makeup, her morbid love of Lord Byron and star-crossed lovers, the word dramatic was made for people like Monique. After my formative years in a rural community, where the most drama was whose cows broke the fence over whose property line, I was drawn to the allure and intrigue of Monique and her theater of a personal life. She pulled me out of my farmer's daughter's role and took me in as a supporting role, even elevated to equal billing as my own protagonist. But despite her amazing emotional intelligence, and mastery of social norms. Her love of pathos, the tragic hero, tripped her up too. Simply put, this super smart, super kind girl fell into the obvious trap of dating losers, thinking she could fix their fortunes by fixing their problems. And boy, there were some real losers. In our junior year, though, when I thought the worst had gotten as bad as it could, along came Mitch. With the advent of Mitch, Monique's presence in our dorm room was less and less as she tried to be there for him, so much so that she couldn't be there for herself. She started skipping classes, and I had to call her over two days to let her know a letter from the college had arrived to our suite, threatening expulsion if she didn't start showing up again. Over FaceTime, defeat masking her thin and worn face, words not her own came forth. Per Mitch, her degree didn't matter. Van Gogh didn't have any paper decreeing him an artist, and thus anyone who felt that they needed a degree to be an artist must not be much of one anyway. I stared in disbelief. I lost my temper and was actually shouting at her that if Mitch returned a tenth of the care she had for him, that he wouldn't put his wants over her life goals. Her eyes widened at my volume, but she said nothing. My volume hadn't just shocked her, though. It also drew a knock at the door of my dorm. And who happened to be traversing the hallway at this late hour, dropping off lecture notes to a friend? You guessed it. Kevin tall and lanky and youthful, his unreadable expression still in place after all these years. He said, I heard you yell. Why? What happened? Near tears, I started by being as simple and literal as possible. That was best with Kevin. I told him Monique, her shell-shocked countenance still filling my phone screen, while well, I told him she was in danger, and I was scared that she was being drained to feed this guy's whims. Just a mess of analogies and examples. Kevin listened blankly, but then reached over and took the phone out of my hands. He said into my phone, You're Monique? She numbly said yes. Are you in trouble? He asked. She haltingly started to make excuses about Mitch's tortured soul, his starving artist suffering for his craft, shtick but the words seemed to fall flat before they could reach Kevin. Seemed to. He paused, and then said, Do you know his favorite cereal? A pause. From the phone, Monique replied, Apple Jacks. Kicks if they run out of those. Then frosted mini-wheats. Never chocolate. Kevin took this in. Does he know yours? Another pause. A trembling sigh. No. He doesn't even know my last name. Kevin was undeterred by the quiet sobs that followed. He looked like a kid who'd finished another puzzle. 
Do you want us to come get you? I have a new car. I could give you a ride in it. She must have nodded. Kevin smiled, fair as a sunny summer day. Okay, I will drive to you, and I'll show you my car. It's zippy. You'll love it. I rode with him. It was a zippy little car. We picked up Monique. She only had a book bag. She chose to abandon the rest to save herself. Mitch destroyed every picture, every painting she left behind. We know because he hand-delivered them to our door with weird things like empty chocolate samplers and stuff like that. Symbolic, I guess. Monique went to the school staff to get whatever protection they could offer to keep him away from her. Mitch was a trust fund kid whose parents cast off wealth to the school, though, buying influence with their scraps. Starving artist, my ass. Mitch flaunted his immunity. But Kevin... Kevin was undeterred. He stayed close at Monique's request. Mitch was too big a coward to try anything with Kevin, and for a while, it seemed okay. But at some point, Mitch must have figured out her schedule, and one night, he followed her to a lecture. She called me from the bathroom, terrified. Mitch was stalking the hall, waiting for her. I told Kevin and Kevin went off to collect her. He texted me when he arrived at the hall, and the last thing he wrote me was, it will be okay. And then nothing. Nothing ever again. The next day, someone found blood. A lot of blood. The blood was tested, and word came out. It was Monique's and Metch's. Further, Monique's broken iPhone was discovered in a trash can nearby. I was beside myself. Monique had always been able to get away, to placate, to avoid her romances getting violent. I blamed myself. Was Kevin's appearance the spark that ignited it into something worse? And where was Kevin? But with Monique and Mitch missing, no one was asking except me. Mitch was found weeks later, or at least word filtered back to us that he was back. His family cosseted him in the arms of a well-known legal firm. He refused to talk. Be it from their influence or from lack of evidence, he never did give any statements that were made public, but he also didn't return to campus. The few pictures of him in the local papers revealed a different Mitch, though. It took me all of a minute to realize the change. He'd always played up being some tragic hero. But now his face, his posture, he looked legitimately tormented. No matter. Evidence from Monique's phone said enough to fill in the gaps for the police. His parents' influence had its limits. Monique being missing was something the college couldn't look the other way on. Mitch was sent away. The rumor mill cheerily churned out that he'd come back with severe PTSD from whatever had gone down, and his bright future was replaced with mint green walls in a ward. And Kevin. Kevin was still missing. His missing wasn't as big a deal to the school, though. For one, there was no blood of his found, and for the second, He'd graduated his four-year program at the end of the winter semester. He'd done it all in two and a half years. He'd not said a word, but his room at the frat house was missing things. Wallet, transcripts. His parents really didn't engage publicly, either. This was all before the explosion of social media, and there's something to be said about that lack of a platform for people to come together, posting and commenting and speculating. I'm only aware of one statement from Kevin's parents, stating they would cooperate and offering their prayers for all involved. And then, nothing. With no updates, the story just seemed to suffocate, its flames gutting out in a puff of smoke. And me? I took a year off college to recover. I got therapy, I finished my degree through distance learning, 
and I moved to Chicago soon after. I needed something foreign. College reminded me of Monique. Home reminded me of Kevin. All of this went down in the early 2000s. By 2014, Monique's family decided time was time and had her declared dead, trying to punctuate this period of tragedy. Her parents reached out to mine to get my new address. They sent me an invite to the memorial. While it hurt like hell, I knew I had to show up. And as predicted, the place brought back every hiccuping tear I'd shed over the loss of my friends, and in spite of their best intentions. The whole thing felt like unfinished business. That was what I brought back with me to Illinois, like a souvenir from the trip. My friend was officially dead, but that thought clutched at me like a living thing that shadow-stalked me around the apartment. At least, that was until the mail I'd put on hold for my trip was delivered that night. For tucked in among bills and flyers for the local pizza place was a note card in a plain white envelope. Inside the homespun envelope was a rustic, thick card. Its front had a picture of an apple orchard, extolling the reader to pick us for their next outing or vacation. The image looked like a woodcut from a farmer's almanac. It was complete with a little farmer in overalls and his little wife in her apron. I flipped the card over, but it was blank. I stared at it for a long moment, finally setting it aside to reread the envelope. There was no return address, but the postmark was from Granite Falls, Minnesota. I didn't know anybody from the North Star State. As I mentally thumbed through my roster of college classmates, something else caught my attention. There was something else in the envelope, something that shook and sounded like grit. I turned it upside down and shook its contents out into my hand. If Kevin Collier hadn't been known for eating dirt in fourth grade, my best friend would still be alive, as officially, she has been declared dead. This much is true. But what about when two butterflies flap at the same time? Is there a way for one effect to trump the other? Or do they mix together, make something new? I have to believe so. Because if Kevin Collier hadn't eaten dirt, and I hadn't approached him to talk to him about it, I would never have made friends with him. And when he heard me shouting at Monique on the phone that night, he wouldn't have recognized my voice and knocked. He would never have met Monique. He would never have become close to her, closer than I ever realized, until I saw that picture of the farmer and his wife on the card and he never would have gone to her aid that night when Mitch followed her to class. The blood, the phone, what Mitch saw and couldn't speak of. There are some things I will never have the answer for, but for Monique and Kevin, I know enough now. Because what came tumbling out of the envelope was a palm full of rock salt. And that's story 24. In a lot of these stories, I find my edits, including adding some form of resolution. Can't begin to tell you how wonderful it is when a story, in particular this story, has its own. There's enough loose threads in the world already, really. In other news, work on the side project continues apace. More on that when it's relevant, but suffice it to say, October is going to be a very big month. Until then, if you have a story you'd like to share, social media and email are in the description as always. Liking, commenting, and subscribing is available to everyone, and super appreciated, but never necessary. I just appreciate you for tuning in today. And I hope to see you again next week. Until then, take care, strangers.